I think we're here. I think it's Friday. Finally. There we go. 30 <laughs> minutes to the opening bell here in Hong Kong, Shenzhen, and Shanghai. You're watching The China Show. I'm David Inglis. Good morning. Our top stories this morning, a cautious star for trading in Asia with investors rethinking their rate cut optimism on fresh signs of persistent U.S. inflation. Chinese stocks are also headed for their longest weekly winning streak in nearly four years. Apple signaling its commitment to China with the opening of a new store attended by CEO Tim Cook, even as it faces regulatory challenges in the U.S. and in the EU. And China and Russia said to have reached an understanding with Yemen's Houthis for safe passage in the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden. All right, what a week it's been when it comes to central bank action, right? It looks like we're wrapping up the week still on a slightly positive note here. We're seeing Asia stocks are slightly up, but it's been really just amazing what we've been seeing, right? The divergence that we're seeing across central banks around the world with the BOJ, of course, with that historic hike for the first time in 17 years. We talked about the Fed on hold, uh, but also sort of maintain that higher for longer scenario here. But certainly with that SMB cut that surprised the market in a big way, it kind of leaves us with a stronger dollar overall as well. Well, so we're on track for another week of gains in there. But definitely what we're seeing across uh, risk assets is still positive. We still see that U.S. stock markets continue to hit, hit those new fresh highs. So U.S. futures are punching slightly to the upside here. We're not seeing a whole lot of risk appetite, but certainly Nikkei is still doing quite well here, just given that weaker yen fundamentals that we've seen. We're still trading around 151.53. Those inflation numbers, yes, they did come out in line, but core inflation speedier than the previous month at 2.8%. So certainly it's something to think about when it comes to what the next steps for the BOJ are going to be. That's why we're slightly on the stronger side here. But certainly that cut, we're watching the Swiss franc very closely as well. That really kind of surprised and caught traders off guard here. And we're watching very closely where yields are. We're pretty flat somewhat here, but U.S. 10-year yield catching a slight bid. We're seeing yields down about one basis points here on the U.S. But certainly that's one to watch, right? Have we really reached that peak in yields, given what we heard from the Fed? Uh, but yeah, we also had a surprise hike from the Taiwan Central Bank as well. That also came out of nowhere. So we're watching Taiwan dollar very closely. The Taix, though, taking it in stride in some ways. We're slightly up about a fifth of 1%. You take a look at what happened overnight, the Golden Dragon Index. We're talking about a lot of tech earnings still. So yesterday was the 10 cent story, Kwai Show. Today it's May Tuan. That certainly is what we're focusing on. Uh, we did see a bit of downside here when it comes to some of these ADRs in the U.S. In terms of how the futures are set up and what we're looking ahead to, uh, certainly uh, there's been a lot going on when it comes to earnings, as we talked about. Um, and it seems like policymakers, We've been hearing a little more of the chatter that they're kind of in a wait and see mode when it comes to further steps when it comes to monetary easing. So certainly that leads us in a little bit. I don't know. We're kind of trading sideways here today. We're slightly to downside here. But yeah, we talked about those milestones, Dave. We're on track for a six week of gains when it comes to CSI 300. Yeah, which is which is the longest one. If if we do get there, of course, we have one day left. It's, we're slightly higher than the close on Friday. But if we do get there, longest weekly win streak going back to uh, 2020, so nearly four years there. We've been talking about southbound flows, 26 straight days. Yeah. We're also in the thick of earnings season, right? So uh, we'll unpack some of the earnings that came through yesterday. Uh, you had a miss from China Mobile. You have Ping An as well. Uh, coming up later today, you have Meituan, Zujin, and of course within Zujin, of course, we're looking at things like gold, for example, which continues to, uh, to give, uh, as they say. Uh, there's a CGB rally. We've been talking about this all week. There's a CGB auction that's also today. I think we have a seven-year and we have a 30-year auction today, if my memory serves me correct. Uh, we talked about the strong dollar, which has put dollar China offshore, to be more exact here. 722 and change thereabouts there. Five-week low on that. We're near the 200-day moving average on the CSI 300. And, of course, we talked about these sound bond flows. There we go. So we're wrapping up the week where it's really been, I guess, in many ways, we started out this week talking about how I think it was nearly half the world or more than half the world's GDP was, was coming out with central bank decisions. And we thought we were done with the drama post-BOJ and Fed. And then Thursday happened, <laughs> right? So you had the SMB, you had Turkey coming out and moving out of nowhere, the Bank of England signaling perhaps that maybe June is live for a cut. And then Taiwan also came out of the woodwork. So BOE was it the first time we've seen no dissents or, or, or policymakers hoping for a hike. Yes, yes. So it was, leaning a, it was more the first dumbish, meeting yeah. where we did not have any MPC committee member voting yes. for a hike. So, which perhaps opens the door to a reduction if things go 
the way they have been going, really. Yeah. And inflation came out this week, right? Weaker than expected. I think inflation also coming out of Canada, also coming in slightly yeah. softer. But certainly the conversations around, do we have to be more proactive? When I say we, um, uh, other central banks, because the Fed's basically told us they might stay higher for But longer. the SMB did basically show, we the can cut before time. the Fed can. Right, yeah. yeah, if inflation goes according to plan. Well, you know, perfect person to t tell us all about the central bank action this Great central bank multi-pivot phenomenon. <laughs> Garfield Reynolds, who leads our M Live Asia coverage, joins us right now. Garfield, are you scratching your head this Friday? How's it working out for you? <laughs> No, no. Well, I, mostly, of course, I'm just uh, glad it is Friday because it's been an extremely busy, even a taxing week uh, you know, for markets with these moves, some of which have surprised, including those that surprised even when the central bank involved did almost exactly what it was expected to. I'm looking at the Bank of Japan there, which carried out its first rate hike since 2007, but somehow managed to send the yen lower as a result. So that was perhaps a bit of a head scratcher. But you know, overall, we, you kind of have to expect that you're going to get these sort of divergences going on in a year where we're moving towards different, you know, we're moving towards changes in where policy is going. But this is in a world where we're not being driven by you know, a single sort of global wave in the way that you know, we had the pandemic came along, central banks had to you know, hit the easy button in the middle of that, and then we had, uh, along with the uh, impact of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we had this huge surge in inflation that was also global that came. We've now had a global disinflation, which has brought us back to a more you know, normal, I keep on using that word one way or the other, <laughs> setting for inflation. You know, we're, we've got elevated inflation, but it's back in the bounds that we'd kind of been used to. It's not, you know, it's pretty rare that there's in developed markets anything like, you know, 4% or above. It's more, you know, somewhere between 25 and 3.5. That's for, for core inflation. That's kind of what you're looking at, which is alarming but not, you know, fire bells ringing when it comes to how central banks regard it. So with that, with still uh, surprising resilience in economies, you've got central banks saying, OK, we need to move mostly towards shifting policy. We don't need to rush. We think we can achieve your know, soft landings all over the place. So it's a soft approach from central banks, but hopefully from their point yeah. of view, a slow one. So, yeah, as you say, right, it seems like we've turned the corner. That great inflation scare we can put behind us now, Garfield. But where do you think rates are going to settle now? Mm. Well, yeah, I think rates, for most of the developed world in particular, are, are going to settle yet lower, but the curves are going to be steeper, you know, which they should be. You know, curves have been inverted or very flat for a very long time time. So, you know, you look at the Fed in particular, that was the underlying message from Jay Powell, which is we're still going to cut rates by 75 basis points. That has to bring two-year yields lower in particular as we move closer to those rate cuts. But they removed the rate cut from their projections for 2025. They boosted their growth outlook. They raised their assessment of the neutral rate. All of that says that 10-year yields and higher are going to stay more elevated and you know so that's what you should expect to see short term rates come down we get an, a disinversion of yield curves and a steeper curve which for that matter you know, that's what you should be getting in the normal course of events if you get decent growth it's weird to have decent growth and apparently no signs of recession and have these deeply inverted yield curves hmm. All right, Garfield, thank you, Garfield Reynolds there, from uh, really watching what goes on in the MLive blog and the like, uh, and watching what real rates really go to settle here. As you mentioned, mm -hmm. that yield curve in the U.S., I think it's been inverted for, what, 400 and almost the 430 days. I lost count after two weeks. Yeah, it's been a yeah. while. Uh, let's talk a bit more about China markets, though, because certainly we're ending things still on a positive note. And the streak that we've been talking about, particularly mm -hmm. when it comes to onshore stocks, has been quite 
impressive. We haven't seen a rally like this in four years or so. Six weeks. Six weeks. Mm. Um, but certainly it's a long time. And whether we have some legs in all this is a key question. Let's bring in Laura Wang, Chief China Equity Strategist at Morgan Stanley. Um, so we talk about turnovers looking more f positive. We talk about northbound flows have been positive since February. Southbound flows have been just been nuts. Are you seeing signs of a durable rally now? Well, actually, uh, we still keep an equal weight rating on over China equity market. But within the China equity space, we do prefer Asia's versus the Hong Kong market or the ADR space. Uh, so if you as an investor want to pick up the right spot to be in, in the China equity space, we think Asia's is where you want to be. Uh, that being said, at the broad index level, we think the uh, upside from here onwards uh, quite could be quite limited. Uh, for example, the target price uh, by the end of this year for CSI 300 by us is actually 30 500. That's pretty much where the market is trading right now. Mm. So I think for investors who are hoping for a very big rally at the index level, I think uh, it's probably better to uh, for you to be a little bit cautious and try to be more uh, picking the right stocks in terms of uh, uh, versus betting on the uh, index rally from here. Right. Uh, fundamentals. I, I know you guys have been in the view that we're not quite there in terms of an ideal situation. How has has that improved at least in the last three months? Where are you? Uh, on that story? Uh, not exactly to the extent that we would like to see and this is why we say uh, whether, why that the market is likely to remain range bound from here. Uh, if we talk about the fundamentals, let's look at the earnings, right? We think the uh, market expectation for the earnings growth for this year is still overly optimistic. Uh, consensus is still expecting somewhere between like 13 to 15 percent of earnings growth for this year, which we think would be very unlikely to achieve. And you price that in and you look at the current market valuation, it's it's quite uh, straightforward to get to the conclusion. Again, at the index level, upside could be relatively capped. Um, so, should we expect that this? I mean, this gap that we've seen with China and and ex China EM. I mean, are we likely to see that sort of earnings growth widen even more in terms of what we're seeing in, in the divergence right now? Uh, what we are going through right now is a quite rapid downward revision of that earnings expectation. So at some point, hopefully, towards uh, second half or towards the end of this year, we could potentially see that bottoming out of the uh, earnings uh, growth, and we could start to see some reacceleration at that point. Uh, so we are still hopeful, and uh, but it also will be uh, dependent on how the uh, top-down policy pans out uh, for the rest of the year, and potentially we think uh, sometime during the year the government could potentially step up the, uh, the physical policies and we could see more fiscal spending and that could help reaccelerate the earnings growth as well. On just net net on a I know you guys measure you have a I think it's a six factor uh, grid that you look at this market yes. from right valuations and I think policy is one of them yep. and I know this correct me if I'm wrong that you guys don't think policy is still net supportive or where are we on that so you don't think we're it, it's quite supportive of a risk rally mm -hmm. but yeah. Absolutely. We, we do have a seven-factor uh, framework seven factor, to assess the, uh, the overall <laughs> yeah. market congestion. Yeah. Fundamentals, which is the earnings we talked about, valuation, policy, mm. global liquidity, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, on the policy front, we do acknowledge that we think the policymakers are supporting, are trying to support the economy and trying to stabilize the economic condition. Mm. That being said, we think so far what we have heard from the NPC, the National People's Congress, uh, the physical budgeting so far could be uh, slightly under expectation and is still more uh, focused on the supply side, which we think the reflationary effort can be, uh, can be focused more on the demand side to rejuvenate uh, the, the demand uh, from both the consumers and the corporates. Uh, again, we think the stance is quite supportive, but the magnitude can be bigger. Yeah. We've seen, I guess, rotation around this market, though, right? When after MPC, there's this new push for new productive forces. You're seeing growth come back in favor in some way over some of the dividend plays that really were one of the darlings of last year. Are, what do you make of this sort of turn? in these markets. Um, is growth certainly something that you're looking at now in this market? Um, we have never uh, not looked at the, uh, the growth because we always emphasize the fact that China as an investment destination, investors come to China for its growth opportunities, not necessarily for the defensive or the value opportunities. At least that's not uh, what the mainstream investors are thinking about, yeah. right? Um, so I think uh, it actually makes a lot of sense to me that investors are doing that kind of rotation because, as I said, at the broad index level, opportunities could be limited. So investors are a lot more focused on 
identifying the right stocks. So we've been saying that looking for the earnings visibility, looking for opportunities stocks that can beat the earnings expectation by the market, because the majority of the crowd could actually be missing that estimates. Is, so, is tech can still yes. consider a growth play? I'm looking at you know the earnings fundamentals are weak, but then you take a look at the shareholder returns, dividends. Mm -hmm buybacks and the like. Is this more of a value play than a growth play now? Yes. If you look, uh, if you run some quant analysis, you see some very well-known and very well-owned tech names actually fall into the value basket. But I think when investors come to look at these names, they still look at like the GMV growth. They still look at the potential uh, potential uh, upgrade of consumption trend in China. So they are still looking at the growth features of these companies instead of, okay, I only want to buy this stock because they are paying dividend, because they are doing share back. Those are nice to have, but I wouldn't consider those as the biggest driver of the stock performance for these, for these growth opportunities. Yep, and again, a couple of minutes. You have a call here. Continue to look at SOE reform as a key mm -hmm. theme to watch. We'll unpack that from Laura Wang and the Morgan Stanley team uh, in just a moment. Their chief China equity strategist, of course. Cutting down to the open of trade, what, 14, under 14 minutes away, Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Hong Kong. Fix it today, bottom of your screens. Happy Friday. This is The China Show. Right, happy Friday. We're about 11 minutes of the opening bell. You're back just in time. In fact, just in time, but just the right time, according to Laura Wang, to revisit <laughs> the SOE reform investment team. She's still with us here on set. Just talk us through this. So this team has been a, around a long time, generally speaking, right? So what's, what's new about the, the current call right now? Yeah, I think um, to your point, it has been around uh, for many, many years. Um, the last time uh, or the, the previous major round of SOE reforms actually took place back in 2013, 2014. Mm. And there was like mixed ownership structure reform. There was uh, uh, compensation uh, structure reform. And then, uh, and then of course, uh, fast forward to where we are now, uh, back uh, towards the end of 2022, there was the uh, mentioning about uh, Chinese characteristics, valuation system for the SOE. Um, of course, I think uh, that actually uh, gave the market a lot of excitement because a lot of these SOE companies were extremely undervalued compared to their global peers. Where we are today, I think uh, it's interesting to notice that the, the, the emphasis on SOE reforms have actually gained new momentum uh, to, uh, to since the late last year. Yeah. Uh, if you pay attention to the Central Economic Work Conference and to the State Council meetings around that time, there's been uh, multiple emphasis and mentioning about SOE reforms and it's not just about re-rating the companies it's more about capital allocation efficiency improving the profitability and uh, reassessment of the asset value and then market cap management so I think it's a much yeah. more holistic approach to improve the operations profitability and then their stock market performance of these SOE companies yeah how I mean it, it seems like the pool that you're looking at is wider now to a bigger pool uh, that, that fit into this realm. I mean, what are some of the metrics? You mentioned some of them, but what are the most key ones that you watch yes, out for? Yes, actually, uh, this may not have been uh, well understood or well communicated to the capital market, but SESAC, the uh, government agency that's in charge of uh, managing the SOE companies, they've been giving out uh, KPIs to the central government-owned SOEs for multiple years. And we look at those, and we think those are very sensible metrics, and we want investors to focus on these metrics. Uh, for example, there is the... Uh, uh, the ROE metric that they have uh, asked the uh, uh, SOE companies to improve upon, profit, uh, R&D intensity, uh, labor pro productivity, and a bunch of others. So those are quantifiable metrics that investors can use them to do their homework and to narrow down the universe to those who are already outperforming the peers mm. on those fronts. You mentioned not a lot of people know this. Is this similar, I guess, to what we're seeing from Japanese regulators, right? Mm. Shareholder returns. Korea, of course, the value up program. I know Jonathan Garner, of course, your colleague, talked about how return on equity in this Chinese market has been falling constantly, consistently for 10 years now. Does this program fix that problem, similar to what we're seeing in Japan and Korea? I think that's definitely part of the purpose. Again, if you want to get these SOE companies re-rated, you cannot push investors to buy them, right? You cannot force investors to buy these companies. Unless it's a national team. Exactly. No, that's a joke, but <laughs> <laughs> the national team, yeah, that's a, a different topic. Yeah. But I think these, a lot of these SOE companies actually quite well, do quite well on the fundamental uh, front. But then if you look at their 
valuation, they are extremely undervalued. So what can be done to further improve the uh, ROE, the shareholder returns, and to make it uh, more better communicated and better, understand it, uh, better understood by the global investors? I think that's the key subject that they need to work on. Mm. Laura, great to have you back. Laura Wang there, Chief China Equity Strategist at Morgan Stanley. We're watching, of course, what's going on in these markets, and it looks like we are still uh, seeing a bit of negativity when it comes to futures here this morning. But as we talked about, we're still on track uh, for six street weeks, weeks of gains when it comes to onshore. Hang Seng is down about seven-tenths of one percent in the pre-market. We got more of your preview coming up. This is Bloomberg. Right, you're watching the China Show. We're wrapping up the week. It's give or take. It's been about seven, almost eight weeks now of this rally taking place. We just want to highlight a couple of things that we've seen so far in this market for the week, and of course over the course of what seven, eight weeks. Seven, eight weeks. Talking about turnover. One trillion is your yellow line. Every single day this week, we've seen turnover top that level. We'll see what happens on Friday. Two other things I want to tell you about. We've been talking about six straight weeks. If we do manage to close. Uh, Above, well, Friday's close for, 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 for obvious reasons. Six weeks, that would be the longest one since, since uh, about the mid of 2020. Uh, longest, as you can see there. So let's see, right? But momentum actually has been slowing a little bit right now. 26 straight days. That's another number to watch here in terms of the net uh, inflows into Hong Kong across the Stock Connect. So mainland investors have been net buyers of Hong Kong stocks throughout the course of that time. And going into today, do we get a buy in the dips? Do we get 27? Futures are pointing down, as you can see here, Yvonne. Yep, and we're watching analyst actions for you. Some of the Apple suppliers are certainly get a bit of a movement there when it comes to Jeffrey. Sunny Optical cut to a hold from the firm with a price target of $47 and change. AAC Tech raised to accumulate at CLSA. And CK Asset cut to neutral at JP Morgan. They're saying that cut to the dividend was a surprise to investors and not much catalyst to this stock here right now. You take a look at CK Assets. Uh, we're down just slightly here, but about 7% down, I should say. Uh, Lee Auto certainly will continue to watch that one when it comes to the execution of the mega model, some say, did fall short. The Open is next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. You're watching The China Show. We are kind of on the open of markets here. We're slightly on the back foot when it comes to the Hong Kong market this morning, and we are but still hitting some key milestones. We talk about six weeks of gains in the CSI 300. Southbound flows continue to be very, very strong. Northbound as well. Is this a sign of a turn? We certainly heard that from Laura Wang from Morgan Stanley saying, you know, maybe it's we're moving away now from that tactical trade opportunity and mentality in this market, maybe to more, more a median term sort of view, David. Yeah. Thematics, SOE, so moving away from an index play, she thinks the bulk of the you know the gains that we've seen are behind us right now, given how far we've come and you know far in relative context is 10, 10 to 12 percent. Uh, it's a thick of earnings season, and so far what they've seen and they think earnings expectations to that very point are still fairly optimistic. So um, in many ways, let's hope they're wrong if you're a bull in these Chinese markets, but they've done the math on this really. HS Tech Index, 1.5% to the downside. We're seeing some downside still as well on the HRS Index as well. Uh, just keep in mind, when you look at your 10-year yield today and CGB in the rally, CGB's in the rally that's taking place there. We have an auction today out of China, 7- and 30-year bonds, uh, so longer term in view. We're still following what's been happening in the FX markets, and hence dollar China at 722. Uh, on your screens right now, very strong move up in the U.S. dollar. Uh, yesterday, best week, uh, best day in a couple of weeks. A lot of that had to do with uh, obviously uh, the reduction in uh, from the S and B. You had maybe a little bit more dovish signals coming out of the Bank of England. So, uh, effectively, your G10 peer space and complex there. As far as the dollar is concerned, flip the boards, please. Uh, has really given that push on the Bloomberg dollar index. I talked about earnings, right? So just about every single com well, every single company you see on your screens right now. Uh, reported earnings that came in short of estimates, bottom of your screens. Uh, a couple of more earnings coming through. Flip the boards, please. May Tuan is coming out with earnings today. China Shenhua as well. Uh, CK Asset, 9% drop. We'll talk more about this, this 
probably is a big story to, to, to unpack a little bit further today. JP Morgan cutting that to neutral. That's also an earnings story coming through. And of course, CK, well, 1HK really, as more people call it in the city, 2.4%, maybe down to that as well. Uh, this is property. This is non-property holdings. Just to flag as well later today, of course, it's that decision out of the UK on this, uh, this potential transaction between three and Vodafone. Phase one, I believe, that that, uh, that decision comes out later today. Speaking of earnings, very, very quickly, we're about 20% into earnings season. And so far, here's how the chips have fallen. 52% have missed estimates. 44% have come in slightly better than expectations. 4% and the remainder as well coming in in line. So we're just entering the thick of things. It's 20%, so not a really big sample size. But perhaps with the big names, Yvonne Tencent was out. Big one coming out later today. Uh, we're perhaps getting further clues here on what the trend's starting to look like here on earnings. Yep. Let's get a little bit more on what to expect out of May 20 as well. The online shopping platform set to deliver its fourth quarter earnings a little bit later on. For more, let's bring in our analyst here and Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Analyst for Asia Consumer and Technology, Catherine Lim. She joins us now from Singapore. Catherine, what are we expecting when it comes to May 20? Right, Yvonne, you know, obviously everyone's on the lookout to see whether the company can give any more indications to consumer sentiment. So we're going to see what's the impact on food deliveries, um, grocery deliveries, and of course, not forgetting that Meituan has a part of the business in travel as well. They do actually do, um, you know, the travel tickets booking as well. That should actually benefit from the continued, um, you know, increased demand for domestic travels that we've seen. But the whole mix of things, um, more importantly for this company, let's not forget that it is facing competition from Douyin, which is going into local services as well. And we're going to see how that actually impacts its margins in the fourth quarter. Right. So of the, of the earnings we've seen this week, Catherine, and of course my question is directly to the companies that you cover as well, any takeaways so far? Well, do you know what, David? I have to bring up Nike, which just uh, reported um, overnight. It does seem like, you know, they are optimistic about China. They are gaining um, share in China itself. And this actually highlights the fact that, you know, even though we've heard so much about cautious buying sentiment in China, um, pricier functional sportswear are still doing fairly well, um, you know, on the mainland. So I think it's a mixed bag that we've seen so far. Okay, Catherine, thank you so much. Catherine Lim, of course, giving us and you guys a little bit of a tease there on her piece there. B.I. Go for our Bloomberg clients there. Our APAC consumer analyst joining us out of Singapore. Big drop in Apple overnight. Regulatory concern, EU and the U.S. Um, I forgot the number, 170, was it 170 billion? In market, 113 billion in market cap wiped out, 4% drop. As you can see, you have a used lawsuit, of course, accusing Apple of violating these antitrust rules. In Europe, of course, it's the Digital uh, Markets Act, so that's the bad news. Somewhat silver lining, of course, is the story we've been tracking here, uh, this part of the world. And, of course, the that big opening. What a night. Yeah. I was just looking at videos of it, and I, I feel like a bit FOMO that I wasn't there. But the crowds were there in a big way. We're talking about that Shanghai store opening yeah. for Apple, which we, we talked to you about. I mean, just, let's, let's just throw to the tape. Yeah. There you go. Tim Cook did show up, guys. He opened the doors. When we hear about the Shanghai store, I mean, it's beautiful. If you take a look at the, the wider shots of all this, but in terms of size, I think it's only second to Manhattan. Manhattan mm -hmm. store. So it, it's great. I believe she's the head of retail there, signing autographs on those that are buying Apple products. Uh, uh, Deidre O'Brien there. So certainly there's a lot of excitement that came out of the store. You know who else was also there? Alan Wan, mm. our senior editor, who was there at the opening. Alan, how was it? Um, you know, I, I, was, I was shocked. I mean, Tim Cook, rock star, <laughs> I, I, I got to say. Uh, I, I got there, and... and I mean, those are the biggest crowds I've seen since the the protests a couple years ago in Shanghai. I mean, it was, it was massive, a lot of security. Uh, the the building itself, it's a great location right across from the famous Jingan Temple, if you know Shanghai. It's sort of like an amphitheater, um, and it's, it's it's sort of like their um, the headquarters in Cupertino in California. So uh, I mean, mm. it's huge. 
Uh, the crowds were just amazing. I uh, I got there early. I mean, I, the, the store opening was seven. I got there at five o'clock, and more than a thousand people already waiting. I mean, not all fans. Some are just uh, onlookers as well. I finally got in uh, at seven. Uh, Tim Cook popped up, shook people's hands. Uh, people were giving them hugs. They tried to lift them up, you know. Um, and uh, he, he, you know, <laughs> and some of the security said, "No, nah, we're not. We're not. We're not going for that." And then, uh, yeah. And then the thing, the funny thing about it was, so I was in, inside the store for an hour, and there was like staggering people in. And apparently, a lot of people still were able to, to go in before the close. So there were just so many people trying to try to check out the new store. And unfortunately, a lot of people, a lot of fans, weren't able to get in. Yeah, you know, for a moment, if our viewers weren't paying attention, you, you would think you were talking about Taylor Swift. <laughs> they're, they're really yeah. Ali. What's public? What's public reaction been? Been like so far? What have you seen? Well, you know, I, I spoke to a lot of a, a lot of the people there and asked them, like, you know, what do you think of iPhone? Tim, I mean, a, a lot of know Tim Cook. They're big fans. I, I think he represents kind of the the face of U.S. in some ways. Um, and uh, so a lot of them are, you know, st are still enamored with iPhone. Although uh, some own, a lot, actually quite a number own both the iPhone and Huawei's Mate Pro, uh, just because uh, they excel in different areas. Uh, so in many ways, uh, talking to a lot of fans, uh, there's room for both, as well as other uh, major mm -hmm. Chinese brands like Oppo and Vivo. But a lot of them think that it's very hard to beat uh, Apple's ecosystem, which, funny enough, is why the U.S. is suing. Uh, the company right now in court. So, I mean, the video is great. I mean, obviously there was a lot of excitement there. I mean, is this a good signal then, Alan, that Apple's commitment to China still still remains intact? Yeah, I, I don't think that was ever in doubt, but I, I think that they want to sort of hedge their bets, diversify their supply chains to India, Southeast Asia, and that's not going to change. But I think, given the fact that you know it's got so many challenges right now, I mean, China is still a uh, you know the second biggest market, uh, second number, uh, second most uh, retail shops. So it wants, wants to make sure that um, you know while we saw the first six weeks of this year with sales uh, falling 24 percent, that's just a little bit of a blip, yeah. and that you know hopefully things will stabilize. And, and, and based on what I saw yesterday, you know the, Apple Apple still has a lot of fans in China. There's a lot more domestic competition, you know. Obviously, there are concerns, the regulatory concerns, but I think that the most important thing for Apple to do is just to continue to innovate and continue to please its yeah. fans. Okay, like I would imagine yourself, Alan, you were, you were holed up there. But Alan, thank you so much. Great stuff, great reporting, Alan Wan. Really content and color all in one. They're out of Shanghai for us. Uh, speaking of Apple, the Apple boss is expected to be among those attending the China Development Forum. That, that event is set to begin on Sunday. That's going to take place in Beijing. Others expected to attend include the top executives from Blackstone, Starbucks, Pfizer, and Cargill. Uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping will reportedly meet American business leaders on Wednesday after the event. According to the Wall Street Journal, that uh, include uh, the heads of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, the U.S.-China Business Council, and the CEO of Insurer Chubb. Meanwhile... A senior U.S. official says Chinese chipmaker SMIC uh, may have potentially broken American law if it manufactured a processor for sanctioned telecom giant Huawei. Undersecretary of Commerce and Industry and Security Alan Estevez made the remark during a testimony before U.S. lawmakers. Washington has been investigating the advanced 7 nanometer processor that uh, SMIC made for Huawei's smartphone. That, of course, made a lot of news last mm. year. Mm. Sure did. Uh, we're we'll going to watch, of course, what goes on, not just with the chip plays, but the tech plays that continue to be the driver in this here, but not today. It's just technical of that. We're seeing a bit of profit taking, it seems, when it comes to some of these tech players are down about 2.5%. Hang Seng, as well as MSCI China, both lower by about 1%. Plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Some political stories that we're tracking for you around the world. A top Israeli official says his country will invade the southern Gaza city of Rafah, no matter what the U.S. says. Speaking on a U.S. podcast, Israeli Strategic Affairs Minister Ron Dermer says that their military will, quote, finish the job and defeat Hamas. Dermer is set to head to Washington next week to listen to concerns from the Biden administration over a potential Rafah invasion.
Yemen-based Houthi militants are said to have told China and Russia their ships can sail through the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden without being attacked. Let's bring in Bruce Einhorn with, of course, this report that we've been telling a little bit more about, this, this deal that's been struck. What more do we know at this point? So uh, the context here, uh, uh, Red Sea, Gulf of Aden, around 30 percent of the world's container traffic normally would go through this area. Uh, a lot of that has, of course, been um, curtailed because of the attacks by the Houthis on shipping that they say um, are, is connected to either Israel, the United States, or the U.K. There have been some instances of misidentification, it seems, of ships. So, for instance, uh, uh, there was a, uh, a missile that came close to a Russian ship um, a while back. Uh, Russia, China uh, have reached a deal with the Houthis, according to people familiar, um, in which the Houthis would not attack Russian Chinese ships, Russian Chinese interests. Uh, in exchange, Russia and China could do things for the Houthis. For instance, both Russia and China have vetoes on the Security Council of the UN uh, under such an arrangement. They could protect the Houthis from any UN resolutions uh, that would be denouncing them for what they're doing in the area. And do do Chinese ships still pass through this route? I mean, how, how much usage do we see, at least as far as China-bound ships are concerned? Because we know there was misidentification of Russia, for example, and I'm wondering how much skin in the game China Well, just has. because of the um, you know, positioning in the world, right. China probably relies less on this, um, this sea route for its oil supplies, mm -hmm. uh, which would be coming, say, from Iran, um, from the Gulf area. Um, that said... China is, of course, a big user of the Suez Canal, so there would be a lot of other uh, uh, Chinese ships or Chinese-related ships that would be going through the area, not necessarily oil tankers. And does it show in some ways that China is playing a role in, in, and maybe increasing role in what's really going on in the Middle East now, too? Uh, well, uh, China has in the past tried to um, uh, play a bigger role, most notably when China uh, helped to broker uh, a deal between the Saudis and the Iranians trying to bring those two together after a long per period of hostilities. Uh, China has called for a halt to attacks on shipping in the area. Um, uh, China and Russia both did abstain from uh, a UN vote earlier this year uh, about the Houthis. Um, uh, they could... Uh, if this, what these people are familiar are saying is accurate, it could turn out that they do more than just abstain in the future. They may actually use their veto. And have we heard officially from the Chinese or Russians if, uh, about, about this deal, or have they... Not, uh, nothing so far. Okay, cool. Uh, thank you so much. Fantastic. Uh, Bruce Einhorn there, of course, with uh, really a very, very well-read story right now on the Bloomberg and also on the website. About 15, well, 16 minutes into the cash market session, final one of the week. It's Friday... Yes, it is. And these equity markets are weak in the knees heading into the weekend. There we go. This is Bloomberg. Okay, just an update here on this, as you can see, the sell-off that's accelerating, in fact, as I speak in the EV space. And I guess the latest trigger is down to Lee Auto and that guidance and certainly below expectations and first quarter vehicle deliveries playing out, as you can see, across this market today. Yeah, the execution or the mis-execution of this new mega model is really mm. what people are a bit disappointed and really hitting investor confidence. So we're down 6.5%. It's really dragging the rest of the EV sector here in China today. Let's talk a little bit more about the whole competition in that space. BMW CEO Oliver Zipsky sees that slower growth in China as a sluggish economy and an EV price war are weighing on the industry, but he thinks it's top-end electric cars that could drive profit this year. BMW has a strong market momentum and, and we are not afraid. We take every competitor serious, don't, don't get me wrong here. But BMW is also a very strong competitor, you know, and we believe in our product strengths. And if you look at January, February, um, we, we, we have a very strong growth, um, especially here in the EU. Uh, the, the, the European Union is currently our strongest region. Uh, just in January, February, uh, almost 17%. Um, so we are not afraid of competition. And um, no one should underestimate BMW as a competitor.
And when in talking about the Chinese market um, and competition there, um, how how are sales shaping up this year? How do you how do you imagine how is it going to play into your mix? Because you know it's been a long time we've been talking about the Chinese recovery. It hasn't come. It hasn't come. It hasn't come. How much growth do you expect in China this year, or is this not going to be a growth year in China? You know, when you look at China, we had super strong growth in in the, in the last decade. We see slower growth now. If you look at BEVs. Our total market share uh, worldwide is 2.9%. And if you look at China, our market share is 3.6%. Um, so China is very strong for us. And um, what, what we see in China in 2024, we will see a slight growth also in China. So we are not, we are not going away from growth. We see, some, we, we see tough price competition, especially in the, in the BEF side. And we will not go into any a serious price war. So we will rather uh, re retreat there. On the other hand, I think we have with the, with, with the new 5 Series and the i5 on the market, I think we have a very, very strong offering for the market over there. And we remain to be a strong player, especially in the premium segment. There we go. Um, Oliver Zipsy, of course, and of course, Oliver Crook. Not to confuse the two. One is her <laughs> colleague, one is uh, works at BMW, I heard. There we go. <laughs> Staying on earnings here, uh, a couple of other uh, companies that we're tracking here. So reporting yesterday, Ping An uh, Insurance, uh, missing estimates here, 23% drop in profits, uh, slumping stock market, of course, hurting investment returns. Their net income slipped to $11.9 billion versus the $14 billion expected. So a stock market routes and falling bond yields weighed on in Chinese insurers' investment returns last year. Now, Sinook, uh, annual profits there at the company falling last year as well. You have weaker oil prices outweighing record production. Uh, the firm reported a $17 billion uh, net income figure for 2023 compared to $19 billion. Uh, that's about a year back. Sinook uh, is more affected by oil price changes than its sister firms because it has less exposure to downstream businesses such as refining. Speaking of earnings and other things that we're still tracking this Friday, so we're almost done, but not done just yet here. Meituan Zijin Mining lead the earnings parade today. So you have one consumer-facing name. You have, of course, one big in the gold mining space, although, of course, the big pickup in gold prices has come uh, this quarter so far. Yeah. Uh, we've talked about EV stock, CGB rally, and also this, this uh, CGB auction today. You have a seven-year in a 30-year bond auction hitting today. And of course, uh, and, and speaking of, we're about to talk about this, this 200-day moving average on the CSI 300. We've come close. We haven't quite had any success yet <laughs> breaking it. Yeah, to show where we are right now, yeah. right? We're, we're getting very close to that technical level, which for, for some time, it's been more resistance than support. And yeah. even after we've broken above it in the past, it doesn't stay up there that long. Mm. So, you know, since basically we peaked about three years ago on this benchmark, that is some of crucial, crucial sort of technical that we need to look ahead to. But then again, we're up some 15% already uh, so far. So certainly, can we kind of continue with this leg? Certainly, that is still the key question here today. And against all this, the backdrop is still a lot of central bank divergence, right? When you come to what happened with the BOJ with their first hike in nearly two decades, you have the Fed on hold, but keeping those dots... But the surprise that we got on this Thursday, <laughs> we didn't think that we would be talking about Turkey or Taiwan today, but here we are, and the SMB. And the SMB, right? So Taiwan came out, uh, no one expected to move out of Taiwan, no one expected to move out of SMB, I believe. Although when you look at markets, for example... Traders were, maybe. Yeah, traders ways, were, yeah. to some extent, positioned in, in, in that direction. Turkey, of course, is somewhat of a different story. Unexpected hike there, so price cut out of the SMB, which I guess in some ways also tells you that some of these central banks will not need to wait for the Fed if inflation domestically is playing in, in their favor as well. And certainly that's the SMB. And maybe you could make that same argument. You probably win that argument this week when you talk about the Bank of England. Not a single MPC member voting in favor of hike. First time, I believe, in 19 months. There we go. Yep. And so basically that's why we're seeing this multi-pivot, right? But mm. at least we're putting the whole inflation scares and all that so, sort of in the back yeah. now um, as we turn the page from 2023. So certainly, um, yeah, SMB, that certainly is, is the shocker here. We're still watching very closely what's been going on with this Apple stock mm. as well. I mean, you take a look at the MAG7. 
it's really been a Mac 5 story with, you know, Apple and Tesla, certainly the ones that have been pretty far behind. <laughs> yeah. Um, this, this probe certainly is what and regulators are looking at here certainly is one thing that we're tracking very closely. But you're still seeing some of these Apple suppliers doing quite well. AAC Tech, for example, that's up with some 7% here today. But you're seeing Sunny Optical heading the opposite direction as well. Sportswear stocks. So... They're declining. The, the Nike story, yeah, Lululemon also lowering their forecast. So we're still tracking really what goes on when it comes to the sportswear side of things. And you are seeing the likes of leaning down some 4%. And we're watching CK Assets, Dave. That one's a big one today. That, that's a very big one. So you had a big drop. Well, it's now 12%. In fact, at these levels, I'm going to do a quick check. This should be one of the biggest drops in, in some time for the stock here right now. This is the stock people buy for, for the dividends. And the fact that, you know, they, yeah. they, the earlier guidance said that they were going to keep that dividend stable, but this cut is certainly a big disappointment. That's the property story. This is a non-property story, of course, also yeah. CK, which is the Vodafone 3 uh, news that we could get later today. Earnings, we talked about this. Plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Okay, welcome back to the China show. Live view of Lujia's way in Shanghai there for is 1.7% uh, to the downside, MSCI China. Uh, what we haven't talked about, we'll get more on this in just a moment here. The weakness coming through in dollar China. Ooh, we're now trading at 724 wow. against the dollar. Okay, that should be more than a five week low, and the rally continues across the CGB space one all the way to the 30. Yeah, because there's massive turbulent week of central banks mm. net net i think dollar gains yeah. above all that Big despite move, yes. the fed holding mm. right because you get you're getting surprise cuts from the smb uh you're getting hikes in, in from the boj and, and the like here but still that dollar yen continues to be on the weak side so we're still looking for clues on, on really what's next for the bank of japan but certainly that fed you know boe as well um the hawks disappear from there. So are we getting closer to maybe that whole inflation picture being a little bit more on the back foot there and we can really kind of focus a little bit more on maybe growth and really how resilient this, this, these, these economies are. But when it comes to the Fed, I think they really want to maintain that Goldilocks is still intact right now. Yeah, almost nothing changed, right? It was the, the best outcome for markets. We talked about that this week. Uh, there's a good piece right now out of Bloomberg Economics and putting the Fed even together with the Bank of England and the ECB that if you look at it, 30,000 foot view yeah. that, you know, everything is on track for cuts coming yeah. in June, right? Even if the Fed's saying, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> anyway, Mary Nicola is, is with us right now out of Singapore to give some color uh, as we look at these markets. And Mary, granted, we're seeing weakness today and maybe China's a different story, but S&P record, we don't mention Canada a lot in, this, in the show. The Canadian stock market's at a record. Asia's been doing very well this week. Just your thoughts on the rally so far and where we are. Yeah, a lot of what we're seeing in the equity rally has to do with that picture that the Fed painted of a Goldilocks scenario where, and and then of course the data overnight just sort of fuels that, adds fuel to that fire, where we're seeing growth being robust and inflation and disinflationary pressures come through and the Fed is, remains on tack to say that the, the disinflationary pressures are still um, there and are likely. So that is actually a really nice environment for equities and a very and and that will continue to feed um, equity markets going forward so it really depends on how strong the growth data comes through and if that disinflation um, come pressures really uh, come to fruition which so far they ha are moving in that direction uh, yeah and what are you watching in terms of currencies I mean I, I think the week this week has really been the surprise reaction on mm. dollar yen after this BOJ meeting, which they did hike, but it almost feels like the market thinks that they cut in some ways. What are some of the catalysts moving forward? Yeah, I mean the clear ca the the clear indication here for for the for the Japan, and this is something we wrote about on the blog, is that even if the BOJ exits negative interest rates, even if they decide to even hike a little bit more, it, interest rate differentials remain quite wide with a lot of their G10 peers. So you don't have a funding currency alternative, which means that the yen is going to remain under pressure. So if you don't have that alternative, um, and, and you're 
you're not going to want to sell the dollar at 5% to buy a currency that is just returning, giving you a yield of zero. It's just not, it just doesn't make sense for a lot of FX traders. So for that reason, the yen is going to remain under pressure. And even if we start shifting with global central banks, shifting towards an easing cycle, it's still more a, a process of normalization for them. It's not like we're going to get, get aggressive cuts. That's something that the Fed has signaled already. Um, so for that reason, it looks like the yen is going to remain under pressure. And Mary, what does that same dynamic look like, but from an EMFX perspective? I know you did some work and you put out a really great piece on really what this means for the carry trade when you have the world's reserve currency giving you no-brainer 5%. Yeah, it really comes down for carry trades that they will have to back everything up with fundamentals. So you can't just rely on high yield. A perfect example of that is Turkey and where Turkey is. Very, very attractive yields. But the fact is that the economy is dealing with record high, inf with, with very high inflation. And they're also dealing with, uh, you could argue, some sort of economic mismanagement. So even though the bank of the central bank of Turkey hiked overnight, it still does doesn't give that appeal if your fundamentals aren't as strong. So let's say you take, for example, other currencies with stronger fundamentals. Um, let's say you look at the, the carry eight index that includes the likes of Mexico and Brazil um, and Hungary and Poland. Th those, those, have, those central banks have shown that they're actually um, going on the right path. And Mexico, for example, was a, was a great example last night where they cut 25 basis points, but they're still very data dependent. They want want to make sure that inflation comes down uh, before they signal anything further. So th yes, the forward guidance was a bit wary, but it's, it's for a reason. And the reason is they want to make sure that fundamentals hold up and that they remain attractive, especially with regards um, to the dollar. Mary, have a great weekend. Mary Nicola there from our MLive team. Strategist joining us out of Singapore as well. Turning to Chinese markets here right now, we talked about the rest of Asia is looking good except for maybe China, although we've talked about hitting six weeks of gains in the CSI 300. We are, you know, gradually losing a bit of momentum here. Yeah. Uh, HS Tech is down close to 3% here right now. Let's bring in Charlotte Yang, our Asia equities reporter, to tell us what's really driving all this. Yeah, so the rally today in Hong Kong is definitely taking a breath in. I think a lot of it's the single company news together. Uh, for example, you know, the, the, the biggest loser on HS Tech today is Liotto, the electric vehicle maker that has just lowered down their first quarter guidance after that the new model, um, Mega, was met with lukewarm, you know, responses. And then you have also, like, with earnings weakness in CK Asset, the dividend there was, like, a negative surprise. And also with PI insurance was not income missed expectations. So I think for today, the traders are more focusing, you know, on that earnings miss is unlike you know previous sessions this week where we're like the more optimistically focused on the earnings green shoes with some of the tech companies you, you put out a piece this week on you know at this point in the rally earnings need to need to cooperate right today's a bad earnings reaction day um, I think we're 20 percent through the earnings season so far and I think our mm -hmm. producers are about to show a graphic to our viewers that it's mostly been misses so far I, th I believe um, just take us through the thinking of what analysts are how they're looking at this prism of earnings right now. Yeah, so I think, you know, for the broader China market, I, uh, what people agree on is that it seems that we have bottomed out. But what needs to happen to drive this rally further is that you need more um, stronger earnings and uh, f from, a, from the broader level. Because so far we're looking at the MSA China, I think 20, at least 20% of them have reported mm. and you have a 12% positive surprises. Mm. But that's not enough to convince the skeptics who have been focused on the just, you know, deflationary pressures mm. uh, with, China, with, with the Chinese economy. Um, so, I mean, for example, like, you know, for the EV sector next week, Everyone is going to focus on BYD. You know, the leader that's going to report, especially after what you know, happened with the auto. So I think um, we need a stronger earnings, especially in, across different sectors, to give that boost to um, investors who are having still standing on the sidelines but has big powder to come into China. What are you looking for next week? I mean, we have bank earnings out of China. Mm -hmm. What else is on, in store? Yeah, I think um, you know, um, bank earnings is definitely to watch. And that sector, has, we might see some you know, uh, weakness there. But then also with um, the electric vehicle um, sector, we also have Xiaomi, which is not earnings related. But you know, everybody has been watching this <laughs> new EV model launch, right? You know, mm. after Apple has exited from the business. So I think that's also one thing to watch. And whether there's going to be a more story than just the mobile phone uh, recovery for the company. Charlotte, thank you so much. Charlotte Yang there, our Asia equities reporter, just really unpacking what's happening today, giving some context on these earnings. And speaking of uh, record drop 
here in Hong Kong, about 47 minutes into the session here, CK Asset, we're now 12% now. Um, really our landlord in this building. There we go. Uh, so growth risk, you have a dividend cut, uh, certainly a negative surprise, and some other commentary coming through here. Uh, I'm not seeing if you're seeing anything here, Yvonne. Uh, our very own Patrick Wong from Bloomberg okay. Intelligence has reacted to this, right? That 10% cut in the full-year dividend signals a cautious business outlook as consensus did expect that dividend to hold steady as well. So certainly this does shake a little bit in terms of investor confidence around mm -hmm. this company. And I think it's the biggest drop on record. Yeah, it is. It is right at 12%. 12%. Uh, and more on the JP Morgan call here. So the 10% dividend per share cut was actually a negative surprise, despite the earlier guidance, I believe, from the company of a stable yes. dividend. So JP Morgan downgrading the stock here to neutral. We're trading at 33. Uh, price target's been lowered to about 34 and a half and 45. So that's about a 10 yeah. Hong Kong dollar cuts to the price target. That's JP Morgan. Morgan Stanley, there's another one from them. We can talk about them later. All right. Still ahead on the China Show, we're going to talk mm. shoe, shoes. Yes. Shoe wears and when, earnings. When the shoe drops. Manufacturers sell international <laughs> on where they're seeing their next growth opportunities. The CFO, Andrew Tam, joining us. <laughs>continue to hear more from Ueda san here this week um of course that's not him talking right now but you know talking a little bit more about the government debt balance to stay at current levels at some time i don't think the market wants to hear about that they want to hear about what the future path <laughs> are they going to hike again are they going to hike again or is it one or done we're not hearing that just yet but we'll bring it to you latest once you hear any news uh this latest inflation print which came out a few hours ago makes them kind of look good um, I think that's part of the commentary we've seen so far. So headline inflation came through 2.8%, slightly lower than expectations. So the trend has been lower. I think if you extrapolate this more into the future, then I think they think fiscal, current fiscal year will still be above 2%. Uh, but again, it's questions around sustainability and how long we'll be at these levels. Core core, ex fresh fruit and energy, 3.2%, also coming in slightly lower than estimates and also a drop. From the previous from the previous reading back in in january yep certainly that's one to watch here right the boj's next move after of course they did scrap the world's last negative rate and signaling and perhaps confidence that the country is finally leaving behind years of economic stagnation let's bring in our bloomberg originals correspondent karumi mori she's here in hong kong with their latest documentary yeah are we get finally emerging out of this whole deflation in japan it's a big question well that was the question we set out to answer. So we traveled around Japan before the Tuesday decision, and we actually went to talk to everyday people and try to get a sense of what they're feeling, what they're seeing already, if not what they've been feeling for a while now. So uh, we did go out. Uh, we talked to many, many people. All the headlines, you're seeing a lot of the changes happening. They are feeling it, too. So I'd love it if you just take a look and see what they say. Imagine a place where everything money-related is frozen in time for almost three decades. Your salary doesn't budge, the price of your unagi bowl doesn't change, and the interest rate on your home mortgage is closer to zero. Well, that was the reality here in Japan. We were used to the price of everything staying pretty much the same. When you compare us to other countries, it's like we've been left behind. But it wasn't always like this. At one point, the economy was growing so fast that it looked like it was about to overtake the U.S. as the world's biggest. Then the bust came. In the first of its shock moves, the BOJ sharply raised interest rates in 1989, trying to curb speculation and rein in inflation. From there, stagnation became the new norm. Japan has been ground zero for some of the biggest experiments in economics, from moving interest rates up and down to inventing the YCC monetary policy, among others. Now, Japan's central bank has decided it's time to end these experiments and exit negative interest rates. Raising the interest rate from negative 0.1% to a range of 0 to 0.1% doesn't seem like much, but it does put Japan back in line with other economies. If Japan's negative rates experiment ends, what now? And how is this massive shift going to disrupt everyday lives across the country and beyond? 
So you saw in the package there Tomiko Watanabe. She is one of the many people we interviewed. We went through the younger generation, some of the middle age, and of course, some of the older folks there, including Tomiko and Suetaka. Uh, they live in different parts of the area, but uh, yeah, Tomiko, she's starting to look to invest for the first time in her life. I love how you said she, she's, she always looked at Ueda as just the skinny man on the news. Didn't really know who he was. Yeah. <laughs> well, that skinny man in the news is delivering. Yeah. Hasn't he? Um, but yeah, I mean, attitudes, right? Like, so, so fine. It's, th this is probably the first time for many people in their lifetime yeah. they're getting wage increases of the same. Um, it's the first time in many, in one generation, at least for a group of workers. Is it changing the way people are looking at spending? Is it making them more, it, r less risk averse? in terms of investment. So that's the question there. For a long time, obviously the BOJ has been printing a lot of money to try to get consumer spending going. It was un unsuccessful. So in the end, we're seeing the external factors, COVID and the Ukraine war, actually driving these changes. But now it is starting to have an impact, right? We are seeing people going out there, spending more, dealing with price increases, which they haven't seen in about three decades. So Tomiko was telling me when she goes to the grocery store now, I know CPI excludes fresh foods, but when she does go there, uh, she looks for the 50% off stickers, the 30% off stickers first. She's really wary of the cat food price is going up and so she doesn't tell her husband how much cat food she's buying now <laughs> but all of those little changes she's yeah. feeling the pinch too and we have to really think about it trickling down she lives in the mountains by mount fuji she, you know she's not in tokyo she's a bit further out including some of the folks we did talk to and so we're finally starting to feel that change for better or for worse people are feeling the impact Okay, so if we, we gave our viewers enough of a tease there, yeah. we can catch that full documentary. Kurumi Mori, of course, fantastic work. They did travel around Japan, including, of course, to parts of just below Mount Fuji there. Uh, on the Bloomberg Terminal, also on the website. What's the website again? Bloomberg.com. Bloomberg.com. Yeah, okay. Friday. <laughs> but it's also available on YouTube. There we go. And uh, some of the social official social yeah. media pages as well. Okay, let's stay on central banks somewhat. Wage increases, inflation, what have you, the broader themes we track here. So Philip uh, Hildebrand, BlackRock's Philip Hildebrand here, uh, thinks uh, Switzerland's surprise rate cut is a signal uh, that the world has turned a corner in the battle against inflation. Speaking exclusively to Bloomberg, the former SMB president, we should note, explains why uh, the Swiss central bank decided to move now. Uh, we've been waiting for this for a long time. The market has been pricing it and had to come off. And now, basically, you know, the first one is out of the gates. Not surprisingly that it's the SNB, in the sense that uh, Switzerland had by far the best inflation record uh, through this difficult period of the pandemic. Uh, so it's, it's a courageous step, but perfectly justifiable when you look at the inflation forecast and the inflation data uh, these last couple of years. So what does a policy mistake look like, not from S&B, but, but also for others? Is there a danger that actually if you cut too quickly, then inflation actually is rampant under control and so it makes your job double harder to, to get on top of that? I think the main challenge they face, all the central banks effectively, and certainly the Fed, is that goods inflation continues to come down. That's the post-pandemic adjustment. That will settle at roughly zero, which is where typically historically goods inflation is. What is not going to happen, in my view, is service inflation is not going to come down. Uh, we have very strong uh, labor markets. Wages are strong. And so my guess is service inflation is going to turn out to be sticky when it settles. And in combination between goods at zero and service inflation somewhere around 3 percent, let's say, that suggests to me that what we're going to end up with a kind of a rate that is going to be higher. And so I think what you're going to see is a higher for longer story that will ultimately kind of feed through the, um, you know, the short-term adjustment of, of rates now beginning to ease, policy rates beginning to ease. Um, Philip, for many years you were, of course, in charge of the SNB. We're now looking at live pictures of Thomas Jordan uh, speaking to, to report. I know that room very well, gathered there to try and understand the path forward. He's also said he will step down. What's the intricacies on, on I guess, the complexities of, of just managing the Swiss economy right now? Well, I think that, you know, just keeping keeping the track record of the S&B having, I mean, the, the legacy of Thomas, of course, is that he has the best inflation track record of any central bank. Uh, and so I think that's the principal uh, challenge going forward to make, to make sure that there's no question that that credibility on inflation will be maintained. And then in the longer term, the question will be, 
And that's partly an SMB question, but more a regulatory question. How do you deal with a bank that is going to be very, very large compared to GDP? Uh, and that's, of course, the, the legacy, in a sense, of the failure of Credit Suisse. So uh, that, those will be the main challenges uh, going forward, I'd say, for his successor. But would he be worried about market reaction right now? So no, I don't think so. I think he's, you know, they, I mean, they've known... How the, the markets they, react they know it. how to surprise markets. They've done that before. As I said, I think he could certainly perfectly justify the decision today. He could have also waited. But in a sense, when you look at the inflation data, the inflation forecast, there's not much point in, in waiting here, so why not go ahead? So I don't anticipate any problems. And if he, if he gets a little bit of uh, currency weakness out of this, uh, then I think you know, that's perfectly fine. So, so this uh, will not create any major kind of market reactions. But it does signal to the world that we have kind of turned the corner, that uh, central banks are easing, and then the question will be, where does all this settle in the long term? BlackRock Vice Chairman Philip Hildebrand there speaking exclusively with our colleague Francine Lacroix. All right, take a look when it comes to markets here right now. Of course, still tracking that dollar strength, which continues here in the Asia session. Dollar yen still holding around that 151 level, despite that inflation print that we got. Aussie dollars on the back foot here, and 724.49. We're back to November highs for dollar China here as we continue to see weakness. There was a dis disappointment, I guess, or at least shock, according to Mark Cranfield from the MLive, that that fix today was above 710. Yeah, they're maybe adjusting weeks. a little bit and giving, because they, they've had this currency on a tightrope pretty much, on yeah. a leash for, I would say, three months now. Maybe the dollar strength recently and the counter-cyclical factor, of course, went into that. Hence, yeah, you know, who would have thought we'd be trading at November levels? But here we are, stronger dollar this Friday morning. We'll unpack the story a bit further in the show. Plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Staying on earnings now, some of the other companies that we've been tracking here this morning, Ping On Insurance, profit fell 23% last year, missing estimates as a slumping stock market hurt investment returns. Net income slipped to nearly $12 billion versus the $14 billion expected. A stock market route and falling bond yields weighed on Chinese insurers' investment returns last year. The stock close to 6% lower here this morning. Sinoak's annual profits fell last year as weaker oil prices outweighed record production. The firm reported $17 billion in net income for 2023 versus $19 billion a year earlier. Sinoak is more affected by the oil price changes than its sister firms because it does have less exposure to downstream businesses such as refining. Okay, this market sell is gaining some traction this Friday morning and really we'll look at the big constituents in just a moment. But as you can see, benchmarks on my right, 2% on HSI. HS Tech is over 3.1 to the downside. CSI 300 has now effectively reversed the gains for the week. So as things stand, we will be snapping that five-week uh, win streak uh, onshore. MSCI China is off 1.8%. Every single sector is down. Every single group, in fact, outside of the formal sector breakdowns. And here's really a map of how that looks like. And you know what? Guess what? There's one color. Uh, as you can see on your screens, coming up in a short while, MSCI China, IMAP Go on your Bloomberg terminals. There we go. Every single sector is down 2.8% on healthcare, 2.6% consumer staples. Within consumer staples, that's where you get a lot of the consumer plays. Billy Billy, Lee Auto on your screens, we're down about 8%. And certainly, uh, guidance disappointing as far as this mega model is concerned. And it, that's really dragging not just Leo, that's playing out across the EV space. Meituan is coming out with earnings today and CK asked. We've been talking about this all morning, quite a substantial drop. Yeah, the, the surprise to cut to the dividend is certainly what is shocking some CK asset holders here right now because they long thought this was a steady sort of play, dividend play. Yeah within the Hong Kong property space. Um, certainly with Billy Billy, there's, uh, I think there was a reports of Alibaba, Alibaba uh, you know, selling some of their ADRs at a discount. That's what we're seeing a bit of disappointment there. We have plenty more to come. This is Bloomberg. All right. The man of the week. Oh, there really. he is. It's not Jay Powell. It's Ueda, right? He's speaking once again in Parliament and trying to, I guess, talk a little bit more about what, what came behind that sort of move to hike rates out of negative for the first time in 17 years. So uh, talking about they're going to watch really 
how market digests the policy changes. They said BOJ plans to reduce the amount of bond purchases in the future without too much in terms of time frame. But the basic stance is to let the market decide long yields. So that's the latest that we've been hearing. But obviously how the market digests this, I think pretty much it was all priced in even before they even hiked, really. And it, now, it did move. Yeah, we're, ta we're still talking about a weekend. Yeah, selling so, the news really what happened there. It, I guess it didn't help as well. Positioning-wise, you're right. It, 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 we moved into that meeting with just about everything priced in. Yeah. You look at some of the yen swaps, for example, barely budged going into that. So it doesn't indicate we'll be at 1% anytime soon on the 10-year yield, by the way, which is bottom of your screens. It also didn't help that you had the Fed, of course, coming up as well, right? And people positioning around that and a stronger dollar really in favor uh, yeah. uh, for the week. Uh, Japanese markets going into the break. We're, yeah, we're just going into, what, 20 seconds into the lunch break there. And as you can see on your screens, we've also given up a lot of the gains we've seen recently. So, well, today, and it seems we are on a fairly weak footing as far as risk appetite is concerned, broadly speaking, in equity markets. Okay, so we will leave that Tokyo story very for now. <laughs> And we're talking shoes. There we go. Why There's not? No, no, no quick pivot. <laughs> no easy pivot here. In Hong Kong, we're looking at Stella International. The shoemaker produces footwear for some of the world's, some of the top luxury brands in the world and also owns its own brand, Stella Luna. Stock is doing that. Bottom of your screens, 4% out with earnings. Full year profit, 20% up. Despite, of course, some weakness coming through in the revenue. We're joined here on sets. No better man to talk about this. Then the CFO, Andrew Tam, Andy Tam, joins us exclusively. Good morning, and thanks for coming on the show. Good morning. Thank you, David and uh, Yvonne, for having me. Suffice to say you're satisfied with results? Yeah, we, you know, we've been uh, focused on this three-year plan strategy we, we have been uh, embarked on. Mm. Growing our luxury, growing our high-end fashion business, growing also sports business, but at the same time, diversifying our production base across mm. uh, Asia. Uh, and this is the first year of our three-year plan. Mm. And we're ahead of the schedule. Uh, we had a 10% operating margin target and a low teens profit growth. But we actually beat both of them uh, in the first year. And looking at the next two years, our momentum is actually very strong. Uh, with, uh, I would say we have more demand than we actually have capacity uh, for at this point. Hmm. Uh, and your ASP has been rising, yes. um, particularly because you, you are shifting more towards the high-end luxury premium products as well. Is, is this a lasting trend that you're seeing? You know, the thing is, this is absolutely true. Uh, let's move into more luxury, uh, more high-end fashion, like say someone like a Balenciaga or Balmain or a Amiri, which is a really hot brand right now. Uh, the ASP in the product is higher because the quality and complexity is so much harder. And that's actually, they come to us because they think of us as the best footwear maker in Asia on product development and quality. Mm. We're not going to be uh, making a large volume. We're a small batch manufacturing, but more Italian style. And that's why they come to us for that product. And their product just fundamentally has higher ASP because it's more premium. Yeah. Why was revenue down? I, I noticed that it was left out of the... I understand why it was left out of the highlights, but then I look, I turned two pages and then I saw the revenue was down. Just underscore well, the drop in revenue. David. Uh, it's true. Uh, so the, fun thing, the funny thing is that once, once you move to luxury, hmm. uh, the time it takes to make a luxury product is four to five times the amount we make a regular product. Okay? So like the output actually goes down. So the volume goes down, mm. but then also uh, the revenue goes down as well. Uh, because it doesn't make up for uh, uh, the ASP is not four or five times higher. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in, in aggregate, it goes down. But also there's a second element. Last year, we do have a sports customer where uh, there's uh, more inventory issues in the channel. Mm. Okay. Uh, but all that is gone now. So everything's in, I would say, inventory in the channel for our customers right. is pretty healthy at this point. And, and what markets are doing well? You know, our, we ship to our customer, the global brands. They ship to Europe, U.S., uh, and China, all over Asia. Mm. So they've been really moving around. And obviously, a funny thing is 2023, China was actually up uh, for us, okay? And the funny thing about that is that a lot of our brands actually never were really had direct to consumer stores in China. Okay. They were selling mainly directly online. And then when COVID happened, uh, Ch uh, Chinese uh, shoppers stopped traveling. They had to find a different path. Uh, basically, to opening stores, uh, tailoring a marketing strategy, tailoring a new product. That's China for China. Mm. And that's actually some of what uh, I would say luxury and high-end fashion brands are addressing now and uh, why China actually grew last year for us. Mm. And, and the outlook for China specific this year? You know, it's, uh, in, in a, I can't comment on the macro side, but, you know, I think right. it, the things, business. The things business. seems weak. For our business, uh, because we have over 40 uh, customers, um, uh, and they all have different strategies in terms of China. But what we hear from them is that they're all really looking at investing in China, because okay. they think it's still the largest consumer market 
you know, uh, well, not largest, but second largest, but then you will be uh, probably one of the biggest potentially. Uh, and, you know, there's a, and especially on the high end side, there's still a lot of aspirational shoppers. They will kind of get to that part where they will spend more money on, on the luxury and high end fashion side. So um, they, what they want to really do now is just really focusing on the right marketing strategy and store and mm. product working with us for the China market. Uh, you also been talking about your three year plan yeah. about where you're really putting your manufacturing facilities. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of it, which has been in Vietnam, but you're kind of diversifying out to, to more of the Indonesias, the, the Bangladeshis out there. Just walk us through what that strategy is now. You, you know, in terms of production, it's all about diversification. I think we all understand that in Asia, there's a lot of geopolitical risk uh, locally in the, in the economy or across countries. So one of the things we always try to do is be preventative. Mm. And we open factories in uh, Vietnam, Indonesia, Bangladesh, and Philippines. And also, of course, we started in China. We have a... So we can provide our customers that diversified base. So they can come to us and say, they don't have to go to anyone else, just come to us, we make good product for you, good quality, uh, and we also, we also don't have to worry about disruption. Okay, uh, if I could, since you're the CFO, let's talk about finances. Sure. Your stock's up, do you think your stock is undervalued? Like what's the general sense of, of, of how the share price is? Yeah. And, and I guess the other question there, since I could, we're talking about it, I'll ask it anyway. Are you, are you planning on giving back money to shareholders in the form of buying back your stock? Okay. So we currently uh, trade around a 9% dividend yield. So we've always committed to a 70% payout ratio for our profit. Mm. So we are definitely the, the returning cash to the shareholder. And there's a focus for us. Mm. Uh, now, in the discussion on share buyback, you know, we have discussion with our board. Uh, I think for us, you know, there's different uh, perspective from different shareholders. Some okay. are more tax efficient, obviously, for uh, buyback. Uh, it's different that feedback won't get from all of our shareholders. So it's not just one, but all of it. And then we'll probably decide later on what we want to do. Okay. You, you also have uh, plans to scale down your operations in China um, a, as part of a strategic plan and creating more value for shareholders. Yeah, so well, there, I the, think there's yeah. two things in China. One, uh, we have a manufacturing, which is a large op larger operation versus the retail side. The operation in China is more about, uh, we're not scaling down. We're looking at that facility for China for China. Okay. We're actually like, uh, doing more product development for those facilities for product tailored to the Chinese market. Mm -hmm. Now, the second thing is about our retail business. Uh, we have been shutting, shutting down our retail business globally uh, because we have so much, I would say, demand on the manufacturing side for footwear. And we're looking at, in anything else, the next three-year plan is really growing our handbag and accessory ah, side. Okay? Okay. So there's so much focus on that. There's just not enough management time uh, for all of us to uh, deal with the retail brand as well. Yeah. All of you guys need some sleep at some point, yeah. right? The executive team as well. So is that, is that, a, is that a trend that continues? Are you per, per, do you see the, eventually the company moving permanently away from retail is, is my question. I, I think there's no plan. I mean, I would look forward, uh, you know, for both uh, Stephen Shi, my CEO, and I, mm -hmm. we're looking at the uh, long-term plan beyond this three-year plan. Next three years, the incremental focus is probably handbag and accessory. Now, beyond that, uh, we haven't had that discussion yet, but probably mm -hmm. not in a retail. Okay. Um, there's a lot of... The consumers and the like that are really gravitating towards sustainability, mm -hmm. eco-friendly sort of products. I mean, is that something that you're very much attuned to here right now in terms of... Oh, absolutely. Of so we have some out? customers that we have uh, recycled material soles. Yeah. Okay. So, but that's kind of the DNA of their brands as well. So not all brands have that DNA per se. I'm all recycled material, but some brands are like that. But in general, across all of our you know, luxury and high-end fashion, you know their quality for ESG is very, very high. Mm. So to be able to do business with them, you have to have a very, very high standard. And that's what we live by. Uh, and then we actually have a dedicated ESG team just to focus on this area to make sure that you know, uh, we, are, we follow all the ESG practices, mm -hmm. but also how we get better in this aspect. Right. Uh, any priorities along that front? That's, that, that's an evolving story, right? Yeah. And you have to follow what your customers do yeah. all, almost on a weekly basis. Just give us a sense of how that story is in your head moving forward. Yeah, I think one of the things of uh, ESG is like renewables. We want to make sure we have renewable energy. Uh, so we actually install uh, solar panels across all our facilities. Okay, okay. Uh, and there, there are factories that you know I would say countries where we operate in that solar panels not so uh, you know uh, I would say common. Uh, I would say th this is something that we're actually leading the effort mm. to do that. Um, I guess I have to talk about the macro picture, which is inflation, which yeah. still remains elevated in some parts of the world. I'm just wondering. Do you still have sort of the pricing power to kind of pass on those, those costs to your consumers and are, right now? And are you now? feeling inflation are cost pressures yeah. too coming up? Yeah, you know, for us, you know, uh, when we work with our customer, they come to us for high-end product development and quality, okay? Their demand and also their end consumer demand is high in quality. So it's not like they're not price sensitive, but they focus more on quality versus pricing pressure. 
Now, when we look at uh, costing with them, we're completely transparent. How much we pay our workers, and they want to know as well. We want to make sure we treat our workers at a factory level uh, at a very high standard so that they are very, very comfortable with. And also the cost of material. A lot of times the leather, the special material that these luxury don't have is their material. Okay? So in a way, it's kind of almost a pass-through for them. You talked about brands like Amiri, which is something that, you know, one of your partners in, in all this. I mean, there's, there's this new rise of luxury brands right now. Yep. How do you see this whole competition with some of those traditional yeah. luxury? How yeah. is that going to play out? You know, Amiri is a, a growing brand from uh, L.A. You know, um, they just dressed uh, Travis Kelsey. Uh, for the Super Bowl. Uh, Did they? Topical. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Very, very cool. Very yeah, timely. Like I, can, I cannot pull that suit off, but uh, he can. Yeah. He's also dating Taylor Swift. I'm not, so very <laughs> different. Hey. Now, uh, with, um, with uh, you know, Amiri, uh, that's one growing customer, but, you know, we have one uh, over 16 customers over the last uh, three years, and that's the focus. Yeah. Because with brands, you have some taking share with another. You never know which one goes up and down. So it's very important from a business model perspective, have a diversified portfolio of customers. And that's what really kind of mitigates a lot of your business risk. Uh, final question. So you mentioned, so you had a drop in revenue. You mentioned that was because mm -hmm. of this pivot towards luxury. Is that a permanent thing? Is, you know, is this pivot to luxury going to cause your revenue to trend lower? Or is that a temporary thing? What's your revenue yeah, target yeah. for the year? So, you know, when we look at it, uh, it's almost apples orange comparing as we make the transition. Yeah. Okay. From what we're currently now versus say what we did four years ago. We're at this point where an inflection point where uh, we kind of the mix where we have a luxury and fashion is pretty more stable, close to what we target. Uh, so I think going forward, next couple of years, we'll probably see revenue grow. Uh, and also profit are, are growing along with it as well. Mm. Uh, but more, more importantly, our target is net profit after tax, you know, uh, low teens, Kager for the remaining of mm. three-year plan. We're ahead of the ballgame, and we feel like the, mall, the, ball, uh, the momentum is pretty strong for our business uh, to continue that. Okay. Andy, thank you so much. Thank you so much. We didn't get a zoom in on your shoes, and I didn't get to ask you what you're wearing. <laughs> uh, wearing Mary today. Ah, there, there we go. There you go, Travis Kelsey. Okay. Um, hey. There we go. A little bit <laughs> on your screens. Here's mine. Come on, come on. A little bit. Go. There, okay. I right. wish I could wear sneakers. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Andy Tam, CFO, Stella International Holdings. Okay, um, speaking of earnings coming through, and this is a reminder that the weekend is upon us. Next week's earnings, big ones out of property, big ones out of EVs, perhaps the biggest one, and lots of conversations around BYD and just going abroad and diversifying away and outside of mainland China as far as markets go. And then it's a very big bank story on Wednesday and Thursday. So keep an eye on all these results coming through. There we go. This is Bloomberg. It's, it's the Reddit mascot at the opening bell of the New York Stock Exchange. And what a debut. Yes, I was thinking it was, it was male, female. It's actually an alien, according to my director. So, yeah, 48% pop on the first day of trading there. As investors really embrace the social media platform's vision um, of profiling from the growth of AI, the CEO, Jen Wong, spoke to Bloomberg about the major milestone from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. It's been our dream, our dream to have our users and our communities to be able to be shareholders in Reddit. Everything on Reddit is built by our users and communities. So having them be owners makes a lot of sense. We're so excited about that. What's the main benefit of the IPO? You know, we always talk about the money raise, the dollar valuation. But I always reflect that an IPO gets your name out there. Not everyone is on Reddit. Not everyone is a Redditor. How do you weigh up the pros and cons of listing? Well, there's certainly a lot of press on a day like today. It is a special day. But be, becoming a public company has just made us a better company. We've actually been in this process longer than most, uh, almost two years, actually. And that process has made us more disciplined, more operationally rigorous, and actually allowed us to get to know investors better and tell our story. And so this whole process has made us a better company, and we're prepared to be a public company. I think it's actually been really good for us. Um, and I think uh, companies that, you know, can 
go public, it's sort of a duty. It's part of the you know, process of maturing as, as a company. And then the benefit of having our shareholder, our employee, employees uh, have liquidity, which we promise to them, and in addition, have our communities and users be able to be shareholders makes a lot of sense for Reddit. Reddit COO Jen Wong speaking to our colleagues, of course, Ed Ludlow and Caroline Hydes on that listing 50% higher first day at school. Right, uh, we'll leave you to look at markets or an offer. In fact, we're hitting session lows right now. It's If you're long these markets, look away now. It's too late. There we go. This is Bloomberg. Okay, there we go. Apple Tim Cook, CEO Tim Cook, they're appearing at the latest store opening, the second biggest in the world. That's in Jing'an, in Shanghai, at the opening. And according to our colleague, Alan Wan, in Shanghai, they apparently tried to grab him and lift him <laughs> like a championship coach. Security, though, prevented that from happening. But suffice to say, there were a lot of cheers, also a lot of jeers, though. Uh, in fact, looking at the online buzz around that uh, opening, in today's China Brief, what's actually trending on, on Weibo is so much not the store itself or the opening itself, but the drop in the market value due to regulatory issues. On the stock drop, uh, no major tech breakthrough. This is on Apple, and the pricing is so high. No wonder it has dropped so much. Yeah, some other users have been talking about you know, having ups and downs as normal for stocks. Apple will get back one day as it keeps solidifying its core strength and expanding innovation. So certainly some mixed views across that. Uh, but more reactions to the news store. There was good and bad. Uh, there was actually, as you mentioned, some jeers mm. uh, at the, cr the crowds, too, where people were lining up. You know, some saying we're seeing how Chinese people are so welcoming to companies like Apple makes me feel that China and the U.S. can achieve win-win cooperation. On the negative note, though, if TikTok is eventually banned in the U.S. on the principle of re reciprocity, we should pick Apple. And speaking of TikTok, this was quite interesting as well. The Chinese Assistant Minister of Foreign Affairs, Hua Chunying, drawing a bit of comparison between the CEO Shou Chu's treatment by U.S. lawmakers and then pairing that with Tim Cook's reception in China. Yeah. Quite a juxtaposition. A yeah. yeah. Could not be more uh, different, I guess, in, in in some ways, depending, of course, on where you look. But hostile market, there we go. That's the screenshot you have there uh, on, on your screens. Can't we all just get along? Maybe the Apple phone can I'm, bring us all together. Yeah, I don't know. I'm a bit of an idealist. But it was interesting, optimist. right? Alan Wan spoke to people. They, they, they had a Huawei phone and they had an iPhone. And they said, look, I can have both. Yeah. I can still have both. Why would you have two phones, though? I don't know. Right. You know, work phone, okay. personal phone. If right. only I could bet on the lottery well, and afford 100 million phones. Maybe, right? Yeah. I mean, take a look at what's going on in these lottery shops yeah. in China. They are actually are ditching bland storefronts and reinventing themselves as hipster hangouts. They've also put out slogans that really tempt youngsters out there. They've been hit by an economic slowdown. Let's get to our Rebecca Chung Wilkins, Asia politics and government correspondent. Joining us now with this story, Rebecca, what's going on? Thanks, Yvonne. Yeah, I mean, this story is just fascinating because it is such a sign of the times, I think. We are seeing these lottery shops transforming themselves into these sort of very cool, hip uh, places for young people. This is a great example here. They're using these new kind of slogans, Mei Shi Cheng Jin. The translation literally is Americanos come true. Um, but the pun in Chinese is that good things can come, can come true. And if we can slot to some of the other images of slogans too, we have southern coffee shops in Kunming, for example, asking people, what is your dream? Suggesting, is it financial freedom? Or is it, for example, buying that dream bungalow beside the seaside? Um, and scratch cars, which also proved to be pretty popular with young people as well. Here is a shop uh, also in Kunming where with every cup of coffee you get a free scratch card. The slogan, a cup of coffee with good luck. Yeah, well, 
at my caffeine levels, you'd think I would have won the lottery if that was correct. <laughs> what's, been the, what's been the impact, Rebecca? Well, that's the, that's the hope. I mean, this is the fascinating thing. It's really working. We are seeing more and more, more and more young people turning to the lottery. These are pictures of young people queuing up to buy uh, scratch cards at Chinese New Year in southern China. And if we can pull up that slot with uh, some of the sales data, sales for last year, 2023, actually rose to about 81 billion US wow. dollars. Now, just bear in mind, 2023, that was the year that youth unemployment hit that record high. One in five young Chinese people out of work. Not just that, but four-fifths of the customers are in this sort of young people category, aged 18 to 34. And, and it kind of spells out an interesting trend out there that, that maybe, you know, the economic climate is really pretty tough. Mm. Yeah, when it comes this is to young people now. Exactly, a really, really interesting dynamic. And it's worth saying that historically, actually, when we see these sort of bump ups in lottery prices, it's actually been when times have been good in China. Because mm. what it has tended to be is blue collar workers, lower income wages, um, actually going out and buying lottery tickets when they had a bit of extra cash. Now it's very different. We're seeing these young students buying lottery tickets when times are tough. That is a very different shift in the trend. And my colleague, if we can just turn to this final quote, uh, really speaking to a lot of students on the ground who are buying these tickets, this quote really seems to sum up what the feeling is, that this idea that it's so difficult to make money, the, one of the only ways it's more likely that you will get rich from buying lottery tickets than you will from working, speaks to this presiding pessimism over the outlook for the economy uh, among those younger folks in China. There we go. Yeah, I'm not sure how I feel about that. Uh, Rebecca, yeah. thank you so much. Rebecca Chung Wilkins there. Fascinating, uh, though, yeah. Okay. Uh, somewhat a chart that looks like that that Rebecca just showed, right? The lottery sales on the up. Dollar China. Similar, right? Look at that uptrend. Uh, four month high on Dollar China. We, This is quite a sizable move, and it's triggered based on what Sokchen is saying by that weaker than expected fix out of the PBOC. Yeah, and, and does it show, right, that there's a bit of a nudge? from the PBOC that they're, w they're willing to tolerate some dis depreciation amid this bumpy economic recovery as well. We continue to watch earnings. May 12th coming up next. Mm. Shares down some 4%. This is Bloomberg.